Welcome to lecture 16. Today we're going to begin the third phase of this class where we talk about the air intake, valve, supercharging, and turbocharging of the engines. So we'll start with how the air gets into the engine and that's through the intake manifold. Uh, so you can see here it's coming in through some air filters and going down the runners into the cylinders of the engine. So what the intake consists of is we're going to start with the air filter and then in a traditional carbureted engine we would have a choke valve uh, upstream of the carburetor and then there would be a throttle valve um, and then the air travels down the runner and into the engine uh, where it finally has to go through the intake valves to get into the cylinder. The runners, uh, generally speaking, they need to be smooth with few bends. You don't want to restrict the air. The less air restriction you have between the filter and the cylinders, the more mass you're going to get into the cylinder. If you're starting with a non-turbocharged or supercharged engine, uh, we need some amount of suction in that cylinder to pull air in. The more restrictions there are on the incoming air, the bigger that suction uh, pressure would need to be. So ideally we'd like these runners to be very smooth um, and and help with the the mixing of the fueled air if this were a, a carbureted engine where the the fuel and air are moving together down the runners into the cylinders. Uh, for other fuel injection designs that, that the turbulence within the runners is less important. But for the very classic carbureted engines the design of these runners is extremely important uh, and is a, a delicate balance between um, size for um, a larger size allows less restriction, more air into the engine, but at very low RPM, the large size runner would have very little turbulence and wouldn't um, properly mix the fuel and air together. Um, one of the things that can help uh, in a carburetor engine with mixing that fuel and air and, and preventing um, the carbureted fuel from just becoming this sheen of fuel on the wall of the runner where it's dripping into the engine it's no longer being uh, properly mixed. Um, the higher temperature we can get the runner the more we'll evaporate that fuel into the incoming air and help with the mixing. Uh, the throttle plate I'm going to go into a bit more detail on that. This is the main feature which uh, changes with the power output of the engine. This is what's controlling how much air we're sucking in on every revolution is this throttle or th throttle plate of the engine. So i got some videos, quite a bit of videos for you today that, that really help. An acoustic nice control stuff. induction system or ACIS automatically varies the length of the runners in the intake manifold to maximize the airflow into the engine and to provide more usable power throughout the entire RPM range. At low speeds, ACIS directs intake airflow through a long intake runner in order to produce ample low-end power and torque. Think of this as taking deep breaths while lifting a heavy object. At high engine speeds, ACIS directs the air through a short intake runner in order to generate more horsepower. Think of this as taking quick short breaths while running. So what this video is illustrating ways that we can um, have the best of both worlds with our inlet runners in, in low speed, having nice long runners that, that help with the fuel and air mixing, and then at higher speeds it would be a short runner um, because it's the airflow would be so much faster that there's plenty of turbulence to to cause the mixing over a very short distance. So this next diagram helps illustrate better uh, than that more modern vehicle of what a a classic carbureted engine intake might be. So this might be more familiar to you on a, a lawnmower engine uh, still having these types of simple features. So the air is coming in through a filter and then we have this choke valve here upstream of the carburetor. And the carburetor is where the, the fuel comes in and through a venturi valve here is being drawn out into the incoming air. Oops. Now, um, 
let's see so the main point to remember is that the fuel is added as early as possible so that it has plenty of time to mix in these small lawnmower type engines uh, but we still need a, a, a valve upstream of that to help get the engine started now what the choke valve is doing is when we restrict the air with this choke valve it's dropping the pressure behind that valve because it's causing restriction and so that even lower pressure down at, at this point is going to suck extra fuel relative to the airflow. So that's what the choke valve is doing upstream of the carburetor. The throttle valve downstream of the carburetor is actually constricting both the fuel and air together. So the ratio of fuel to air doesn't change uh, with the throttle valve, but the total flow rate of both does change with the throttle valve. Now, a, a nice, good, highly volatile fuel will very quickly um, be sucked out of this carburetor by the Venturi effect and evaporate and mix. Um, but you can see how depending on the geometry of the inlet runners and exactly how the carburetor is positioned, maybe this is your lawnmower and you're on a slope so things get tilted. Um, other things may happen that, that cause sort of a film of fuel to develop on one side of your, your inlet runner. And then, then you sort of have this liquid sheen that has to evaporate. It's no longer coming out as nice small droplets. Um, that is one of the major factors leading to variation between combustion cycles if you're not getting that uh, smooth, consistent air to fuel ratio. Um, and to avoid suddenly stalling out the engine, um, you have to have a very slow throttle response. Uh, when when you're subject to things like this with the the liquid pooling up on the walls um, in the, in the inlet runners so uh, this is just illustrating what happens with choke when we close this valve pressure drops and we're getting more fuel for the same air and throttle body injection is similar to this concept illustrated in this figure it's still um, injecting the fuel at this stage we no longer need the choke valve because we can directly control the fuel injection um, but we are going to inject the fuel as early as possible so that it's very evenly mixed and there's not going to be an imbalance between cylinders when one injector might get uh, clogged up the next evolution of engines was a move towards multi-point or uh, what was by some companies considered uh, direct injection but it was multi-point injection and then eventually into uh, gasoline direct injection and I'll show a video on that but first uh, let's get to multi-point fuel injection and the idea here is we still have the air coming in through a filter and we've we've throttled it at some point uh, in that inlet runner and then um, as it's passing over the different cylinder heads, so each one of these is a different cylinder of the engine, the fuel is being sprayed uh, right near, um, right at the same point that the inlet valve is opening. So it's spraying the fuel directly into the air as they're both rushing into the cylinder. Um, it's a bit more control over the air to fuel ratio. You have less concern with wetting on the walls because you're able to spray it directly into a high velocity gas that's going in through that valve. Um, the other advantage to this is you're able to improve the volumetric efficiency slightly. Um, you're spraying it essentially into the cylinder but not, not quite directly so it's not as big an improvement as moving to direct injection. Um, the other reason for this move was uh, it eliminated a lot of the design constraints on the inlet runners. You didn't need to uh, have this long inlet runner and turbulent flow uh, to evaporate the, the fuel. So you could have short, large diameter inlet runners that maximize the volumetric efficiency and get more power out of a small engine. So again, this was this innovation is def definitely about more power uh, out of a smaller engine. So what had what was the drawback to moving uh, from the typical carburetor or, or 
um, throttle body injection this is um, definitely has to uh, improve the turbulent mixing in the cylinder to ensure mixing since most of the time that the air and fuel are in contact is actually during that uh, intake and compression stroke of the of the cycle and so making sure that the cylinder and the, the inlet valves here are designed to imp to create as much swirl and tumble um, and squish as possible to ensure proper mixing. So those innovations went hand in hand. So I've got a couple videos in a row I want to show you. The first one is uh, detailing how modern gasoline direct injection works. And the second video is going to focus on how scavenging of the exhaust helps mitigate turbulent lag. Um, and it's only possible when you've gone to gasoline direct injection because you couldn't do this scavenging uh, as well if, if you weren't injecting directly into the cylinder. You'd, um, your air fuel ratio and would get all out of whack. Um, the finally, the, the more accurate we can measure the fuel flow, the more uh, the closer to the ideal air to fuel ratio we can get on every single cycle of the engine. So this move from a carbureted engine to eventually gasoline direct injection is all about having more consistent even combustion every time so we can control the pollutants and um, increase response speed of the engine. The fuel is compressed by the high pressure pump to the required pressure level of up to 200 bar and stored in the fuel rail. There, a high pressure sensor measures the current pressure. Mounted on the fuel rail are high pressure injectors that meter the fuel and spray it under high pressure right into the combustion chamber. Bosch injectors with innovative laser drilled spray holes provide maximal flexibility in spray configuration while minimizing wall wetting in the combustion chamber. To achieve the best possible combustion, during gasoline direct injection the air fuel mixture is created right inside the combustion chamber. The intake air control supplies the engine with the correct amount of air mass at every operating point. One input variable is the amount of air taken in, which is measured by the hot film air mass flow sensor. Further on, the intake manifold low pressure sensor measures the air pressure. The throttle body controls the air supply to the engine cylinders by enlarging or reducing the diameter of the intake manifold. The air fuel mixture requires an ignition spark to combust within the engine cylinder. For this, the ignition coils generate a high voltage of around 30,000 volts, store it briefly, then transfer it as a high voltage current impulse to the spark plug. Turbocharging enables a larger air mass to enter the combustion chamber. Thus, more air fuel mixture is combusted, improving performance. The exhaust gas turbocharger uses the energy of the exhaust to compress the intake air. With gasoline direct injection and exhaust gas turbocharger, engine displacement is reduced, enabling the implementation of downsizing concepts. The loss of engine performance resulting from reduced engine displacement is compensated by the turbocharging. Optimization of the individual operating points creates engines that deliver low fuel consumption and CO2 output with no loss of performance. Okay, and this one... Turbochargers require a certain minimum engine speed to attain their charge air pressure. If the speed is too low, a turbo lag occurs. Scavenging is the system innovation from Bosch that works to counteract turbo lag. To this end, the intake and exhaust valves are open simultaneously for a moment. This creates a dynamic pressure differential between the intake and exhaust sides of the engine. Fresh air flows into the combustion chamber and flushes the exhaust gas from the cylinder through the open exhaust valve towards the exhaust manifold. The increased flow of exhaust gas creates 50% more torque at low engine speeds, counteracting turbo lag. And finally... Exhaust gas treatment from Bosch contributes to compliance with international emissions regulations. 
The Planar Wideband Lambda Sensor and the Switching Type Sensor measure the oxygen content of the exhaust, thus providing the engine control unit with basic information for the correct mixture. Future legislation regarding particulate reduction presents new challenges for combustion engines. With the unique and innovative System Solution Controlled Valve Operation, or CVO, for engines with gasoline direct injection, Bosch has successfully employed mechatronics to make a major contribution to achieving compliance with future statutory emissions limits, such as Euro 6 and Sulev. Key components of CVO are the Bosch Engine Control Unit and the Bosch High Pressure Injector. Contrary to the conventional pilot-controlled injection, the control unit and high-pressure injector operate in a closed-loop system. During the injection, the control unit measures the activation signal and determines the opening and closing of the valve needle to compute the duration of the open phase. Thus, the electronic control unit can calculate the actual injection amounts of every injection and readjust if necessary. This type of closed-loop activation makes it possible to meter even the smallest injection amounts with minimal tolerances. The precision of the gasoline injection is thus significantly improved in this area and is maintained throughout the working life of the valve, guaranteeing a stable combustion procedure. So if you um, didn't catch the point of that last bit, what they're trying to do is always deliver the correct amount of fuel even with wear and tear. So being able to measure um, with each cycle, so I remain a hundred times a second uh, for each cylinder, how much fuel was sprayed in there allows them to make long-term adjustments as the valves wear out of how much fuel is going in into the cylinder. <clears throat> So that's how we get the fuel and air mixed. The next part is getting the air into the actual engine. And so what I want to talk about is um, the cross-sectional area in which the incoming air um, can flow through when we lift the valve and allow air into the cylinder. So generally there's an effective cross-sectional area which is related to the actual area by a single coefficient here, CD, discharge coefficient. And so if you imagine what I'm looking at uh, in this drawing on the right is um, this area is what I'm concerned with and that is sort of a donut shaped around the top, top of this valve. So when this valve lifts, um, that cross section is sort of on, on all sides around. So that's where the pi times the diameter of the valve times the amount of lift, uh, so this, this height um, is going to give us the actual cross-sectional area uh, that air could flow through. And then this dr discharge coefficient tells us how much less air than ideal flows at because there's going to be constriction around the edges uh, of this inflow um, and that's what the discharge coefficient takes into account. Oops. So the important factors in trying to have a very high discharge coefficient because we, we don't want to restrict the air into, into the engine at this point. So the valve seat width, so that would be the distance from here to here. Um, that the part of the s cylinder head that's in contact with the valve, um, that's an important factor. The angle that, that those are in contact at is important, and then just how smooth or rounded all of these edges are plays an important role in, in improving the, the, the airflow into the engine. Now, the trade-offs are the more rounded we, we make everything, the harder it is to seal the valve when the valve is closed. So that's more of a priority is make sure you don't have air uh, leaking out of the engine during your power stroke. Um, so, so first it needs to have a very good seal, a uh, very good seating, and, and then 
wants to open up nice and wide as quickly as possible. So flow through the valve. Um, this equation here is the standard uh, equation for valve, uh, flow through a, a compressible valve like this. So it's starting to pull in some terms that you might recognize from fluids. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail on the compressible flows in, in the examples today. Um, but this is fairly straightforward. It, it's one function here that is a function of the uh, stagnation pressure, so the, the ambient air pressure, and then the pressure inside the engine uh, on the sort of downstream side. And this equation applies uh, whether we're bringing air into the engine or taking air out of the engine. So when we're bringing air in, the upstream flow is obviously the outdoor ambient or perhaps it was supercharged or turbocharged air pressure. So that um, incoming air pressure is P naught and the pressure inside the cylinder here would be PV. When we are doing the opposite and we're exhausting, now flow is going the other way, uh, the P naught is going to be our upstream stagnation pressure and that'll be the pressure uh, we have before blowdown or during blowdown. And then this PV will be the pressure in the exhaust system uh, on its way out. Um, so I, I don't want to develop bad habits on, on P naught always being ambient pressure. Uh, when we're doing examples of it being an intake, uh, then that very may well be the case. But when we're doing exhaust valves, it's going to be the pressure in the cylinder. So paying attention that PV is the downstream pressure and P naught is the upstream uh, pressure. So let, let me switch over uh, and do, do this example. Um, I thought the results on this one were animated. But let's imagine we're looking at the inlet velocity going through a valve as it opens. Now this example is going to try and illustrate that if we didn't take compressible flow into account, we would vastly overestimate how much flow we could get into the engine. And for this example, we're going to start by assuming incompressible and find out what the velocity would be. And then we're going to compare that to the speed of sound of ambient air, which is 330 meters per second. Just let me open up one note here. Okay, so in our example, we have a three liter six cylinder engine with a compression ratio of nine, and it's operating at 4,000 RPM and we're going to assume that the intake valve is open for 90 degrees. So it's going to be open during the entire intake stroke. We're going to assume the valve diameter is three centimeters and the lift is six millimeters. We're going to assume a square engine uh, with a discharge coefficient of five, 0.5 and we're going to find the average velocity of air entering the engine. So the reason I needed all that information, I needed to find out um, how much mass was was going into the engine in every cycle. So from from the fact that we have uh, three liters and um, we have a square engine um, that should be enough uh, with the standard density uh, of air to basically calculate that the incoming air in the engine would be 5.8 seven uh, times 10 to negative fourth kilograms in each cycle. So to get that much air into the engine, how fast would it have to squeeze through that single inlet valve? And so the effective cross-sectional area of that inlet valve would be the discharge coefficient multiplied by pi times the diameter of the valve times the lift on the valve. 
So if I put what was given in this problem, I had a dis uh, charge coefficient of 0.5, and then I'm gonna multiply by pi. Um, now the diameter of this particular valve was three centimeters, so times 0 0.03 meters. And I'm gonna multiply by a lift of six millimeters, so times 0 0.006 meters. And I'm gonna get an effective cross-sectional area of 2.83 times 10 to negative four meters squared. Now to get this volume through this cross-sectional area, we can find the velocity using the standard density of air. Since this is inlet, um, we're just assuming it's standard temperature and pressure air coming in. So that velocity, um, so we're going to use u to represent the velocity here today, and we'll have the mass that I need to get into the cylinder divided by density uh, times area times time. So this should work out to the correct unit. So we've got 5.87 times 10 to negative 4 kilograms over the standard density of air. I'm going to use 1.225 today kilograms per meter cubed and multiply by 0.00375 seconds. Um, I forgot I need to explain where that time came from. I'll come back and do that. And then finally multiplying by our cross-sectional area of 2.83 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. So let's look at the units. We're going to cancel out two of the meters squared to the meters that way. Kilograms are gonna cancel out, and what we should be left with is something in meters per second, and it is in fact 451 meters per second. So our conclusion that this velocity is much faster than uh, M uh, Mach number one, um, the velocity is 330 meters per second. So this would be a supersonic nozzle and that's that's not something we're going to allow it would be choked so this this velocity isn't possible uh, stepping back I need to mention where this time came from uh, this is a simple conversion of um, the 90 degrees of crank angle to time so if we have 90 degrees uh, that the valve is open and I divide by 4,000 revolutions per minute times uh, one minute over 60 seconds and then multiply by uh, one revolution over 360 degrees I'm going to get a time of 0 0.00375 seconds so that's how long the valve is open and we're going to assume it, it opened its full lift instantaneously and stayed lifted uh, for that entire time. And if that were true, to fill the engine uh, cylinder to atmospheric pressure, uh, we would need an inlet velocity of, of 451 meters per second, and that's simply not possible. Okay. So quick recap of compressible flow. Uh, if you've had your fluids class already, this should be familiar. Um, just gonna briefly recap why, where some of these um, stagnation type of questions, uh, equations come from. And when can we assume compressible versus incompressible? So if we plotted out the density, if something is incompressible, its density is not changing. So under what region is the density not changing? Well, really at a Mach number less than 0.5, the density hasn't changed by more than 12%. That's generally negligible. So we can typically assume Mach numbers less than 0.5 and consider those to be incompressible. Once we get up around a Mach number of one, 
the density, the stagnation density is nearly double uh, that of, of uh, something that's not flowing. Um, <clears throat> and that, that we cannot neglect. So once we're in this region above, 50, uh, above a Mach number of 0.5, we really need to work with compressible flow. And we're going to get a bunch of different stagnation type equations like this. This is the stagnation equation for density. So the stagnation density relative to the measured or, or local density is 1 plus the ratio of specific heats minus 1 over 2 times the Mach number squared, all of that raised to the 1 over gamma minus 1. We also have this for temperature and pressure. Um, I guess another couple slides I'll, I'll come back to those equations. Um, but I first want to um, talk about what we mean when we say choked flow and then show you a video of an inlet valve uh, velocity profile. So choked flow occurs when um, the, the pressure uh, ratio um, is greater than gamma plus 1 over 2 raised to this gamma over gamma minus 1. At this pressure ratio, we've accelerated the flow to a Mach number equal to 1. And unless you have a converging diverging nozzle, Mach 1 is the fastest you can get. Uh, so it would, um, no more flow would be allowed. Even if I lowered the pressure, that's going to cause a shock wave, but it's not going to allow more mass into the engine. Uh, so what is that limiting mass flow? The limiting mass flow is essentially the upstream uh, density times that effective area uh, of your inlet valve. And then um, we have the speed of sound and uh, this, this function of the ratio of specific heats. So what does the inlet velocity look like of a real engine? And if you look at the intake valve, you're going to see this center flow that's very high velocity and then there's a bit of constriction along the edge surfaces um, as it flows into the engine. So there that red spot is the high velocity flow um, and then it smooths out uh, as it enters the engine. So I have another video I want to show you to introduce you to the concept of variable valve timing and then we're going to come back and, and do an example uh, to do with, with stagnation um, and sort of a isentropic nozzle. First, a quick lesson in engine valves and what they do. On this big old cutaway Ford Shelby motor, you can see them clearly. The intake valves open to let the air and gas into the cylinder. The exhaust valves open later to let the burned air and gas out of the cylinder down into the exhaust. Valves are operated by camshafts. You see these guys up here, they turn with the engine, and these off-center lobes that are mounted on them push the valves open or not as they turn around. These are dual overhead cams. There's one cam for exhaust valves, a separate one for intake valves. Also notice this engine has four valves per cylinder, like many do these days. You've got more area to let the engine breathe in and out. But here's the problem. A strictly mechanical system operates the same way at all RPMs and all engine loads. That's not ideal for MPG, horsepower, or emissions. You want to vary this behavior at different points of the engine's rev range. That's why we have variable valve timing. And it changes three parameters. Valve timing. At what points in the engine's rotation do the valves open and close? Valve duration. How long the valve stays open once it is? And valve lift. How far a valve moves off its seat when it opens? So varying all those valve events, as they're called, allows this engine, and most importantly, its electronic control unit, can constantly make a call to get the most power, the best MPG, and the lowest emissions all at once. Now, I could do an hour on why that works, but here are just a couple simple examples. If you leave this exhaust valve open longer on one stroke, you get all the exhaust blown out of there. That leaves a fully open and clean cylinder to take in the maximum gas and air on the next gulp, and that could give you more power. On the other hand, if you close that exhaust valve a little sooner, you leave some exhaust in here. That fills part of the cylinder, and therefore you take in less air and fuel the next time. 
That kind of creates a virtually smaller engine for a moment. And that could give you better MPG. Now, the mechanisms that allow these valves to change their behavior are almost as numerous as there are manufacturers of engines. Here are just a few examples. First of all, some cars have multiple sets of lobes on their camshafts, and different lobes of different shapes are used at different points in the engine's operation. Here's another example. Sometimes you will change the relationship between the rotation of the crank and the rotation of the camshaft, so they aren't always locked one to one. Another technology is what's called an eccentric cam drive. So the engine's turning at a certain RPM, but eccentric drives here on the ends of the cams allow them to accelerate and decelerate their rotation. That gives you a degree of control as well. Now, who invented all this variable valve timing stuff? Interestingly, Fiat is often given credit as having the first mainstream production-ready system, dating back to a 1969 patent application. But today, you know it as multi-air. We saw it recently in the new Jeep Cherokee, now owned by Fiat, of course. It's their version of changing valve events using hydraulic pressure out of the oil system. The most famous kind of valve timing, yes, valve timing can be famous, is Honda's VTEC, the source of one of the biggest memes ever on the internet. And just about every car maker has their own brand of variable valve timing, and they push it hard, which is weird considering how few car buyers have any idea what it is. But now at least you've got a pretty good idea of how this one technology has dramatically improved how engines raise MPG, increase horsepower, and lower emissions. It's one of the great revolutions in engineering in cars in the last few decades. I was like, listen to him, he's quite entertaining and energetic if you have a chance to, to watch any of his other videos. Okay, um, so I want to move on today to, to a little short discussion on uh, compressible flows uh, and, and work through a slight example on that. One of the things I want to remind you in, in where we derive all of these from, so these stagnation equations uh, really stem from first law. Uh, and, and energy. So in energy we, we always had um, that sensible enthalpy plus potentially some kinetic energy. So this is looking like the, the um, enthalpy was the internal energy plus the flow work and then now we're adding to that this kinetic energy term. So that's what this is, is generally looking like. Uh, in this slide all of the U's are representing velocities, not internal energies. Um, so how are those two things similar? Well, if I substitute into the stagnation equation for temperature, uh, I substitute in that Mach number is equal to the velocity over the square root of gamma RT. And if I know that um, this gamma is equal to Cp over Cv, and R is equal to Cp minus Cv. I make those substitutions, I get that gamma minus one over gamma is equal to R over Cp, two constants. And then I can get this essentially down to the fact that the stagnation temperature is equal to the original temperature plus this um, kinetic, what looks very much like a kinetic energy term, u squared over 2cp. Um, simply multiplying through by cp, if um, we assume cp is constant, uh, you would end up with what looks like this first law in terms of, of enthalpy. So that's just a, a quick reminder that this stagnation temperature isn't some um, imaginary state. It's a measure of the total energy, both thermal in the um, enthalpy term and kinetic energy, all wrapped into one temperature um, for, for the flow. And it's a similar sort of derivation to get to the stagnation pressure. So these are the main compressible flow equations that we always have to remember. Stagnation temperature, stagnation pressure, uh, and then the one on the, the earlier slide for stagnation density. And then how do we go ahead and use them? Well, what we're going to use them in is essentially a 
uh, isentropic nozzle. So not worrying about uh, the supersonic converging diverging part of this. We're just going to uh, focus on, on this as a nozzle, cutting it off there at the throat. Um, so if we start from an energy equation, and um, enthalpy plus kinetic energy um, plus any heat transfer and minus any work. In this simple nozzle, we're going to neglect any heat transfer. So that gets rid of the heat transfer and we're gonna neglect any work. And what that leaves us with, um, both upstream and downstream of our nozzle, is a balance of the enthalpy and kinetic energies. And now we have a term that represents those two terms together. So this is basically saying that the upstream stagnation temperature is equal to the downstream stagnation temperature. And that's how we set up to solve all of these conditions. So upstream, you know some temperature, and you can find the velocity. And then downstream, it might have a temperature and velocity. So how far upstream do we set our nozzle? Well, ideally, we're going to set this uh, upstream point far enough upstream that we're going to have essentially no velocity, at least negligible Mach number. So far enough upstream, the temperature of our ambient air is our stagnation temperature. And then we're able to solve for Mach number and temperature downstream at the nozzle. Same idea for pressure. Eventually we, we identify conditions far enough upstream that the Mach number of the upstream flow is essentially zero. So the next step uh, in the nozzle flow is what is the um, area relative to the choked flow area? So this is going to help us figure out what, how much air we could possibly get into the engine. And all this is doing is it's starting from a mass conservation. So the mass flow rate is equal to the density times the velocity times that cross-sectional area. And that's true both upstream and downstream at the nozzle. So if I um, put in some substitutions and you can follow this math on your own, what we're able to get to is by assuming the downstream flow is at a Mach number equal to one, that becomes our A star, we can get to a equation for the area as a function of the Mach number uh, relative to that choked flow. And what does that look like graphically? Well, the we're going to focus for our, our inlet and exhaust nozzles on um, this sub, uh, a Mach number less than one. And you can see that um, as the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as you get closer and closer to uh, Mach number one, um, the pressure you're getting uh, downstream of the, the nozzle, uh, the, the high velocity pressure relative to its upstream stagnation pressure um, is very low. So the, the more we restrict the nozzle and the closer we are to that Mach number of one, we're going to dramatically reduce the volumetric efficiency of our engine um, because we're gonna require a lot of suction pressure to suck the air in that fast. And this is why eventually turbochargers and superchargers make up for it by giving us that boost and, and allow the volumetric efficiency to come back up. So let me walk through one last example today. And this is how we would estimate the maximum flow rate through an exhaust valve um, using these equations. Um, I'm more focused on the exhaust valve because at the higher temperature of the gases, they need a uh, larger valve to, to exit than, than the inlet. It's less dense uh, when it's at high temperature, so um, it's going to need a bigger valve to go through. So generally when we're talking about choking in these valves, and choking meaning um, the limiting mass flow through the valve, uh, not choking the way we do to control the fuel flow of the engine. Um, choking in this sense is, is mainly uh, during the exhaust or blowdown is the point at which these, these valves are choked. 
So let me um, make another example here. And in this example, we're going to try and find what the flow rate through an exhaust valve is that is four centimeters in diameter. So diameter is four centimeters and it's going to have an eight millimeter lift. Um, we're going to assume the discharge coefficient to be 0.6 and we're going to note that before uh, it opens, so right at the start of blowdown, the cylinder is at, um, so we've been calling that, I think we're on um, T5 is right before blowdown. Um, T5 is 900 Kelvin and the pressure at that point, P5, is 450 kPa. Um, and then we're going to note that the, the P ambient, so P6 that we're, we're dumping to, is 100 kPa. So that's what's in the exhaust system right now, is a pressure of 100 kilopascals, and what's in the cylinder is 450. So we're clearly, um, this, this pressure difference across the cell, uh, across the valve, um, P, sorry, P5 over P6, is definitely greater than 1.86. So we know it's going to be choked flow. So I'm going to use the choked flow equation to find out initially when it just first starts to blow down what the flow rate is. So the choked flow equation was m dot equal to oops, the density uh, upstream times that effective area times c naught speed of sound, um, 2 over gamma plus 1 raised to the gamma plus 1 over 2 gamma. Whoa. It's really annoying why it does that. Okay, let me rewrite this equation. So we have m dot rho AC naught 2 over gamma plus 1 raised to the gamma plus 1 over 2 gamma minus 1. So that's our equation for choked flow and we're going to need to put in some substitutions here. So how do we get the upstream density? Well we can use the ideal gas law to basically say it's the upstream stagnation pressure over R times the upstream stagnation temperature uh, upstream of our valve and then we have the cross-sectional area which we know how to find and then the speed of sound is just going to be gamma r times the upstream stagnation temperature. And then the rest of this remains unchanged. 2 over gamma plus 1 raised to the gamma plus 1 over 2 gamma minus 1. So now I know everything I'm going to substitute in because the upstream pressure and temperature, uh, what I had P5 was 450 kPa. That's our upstream stagnation pressure in the cylinder. It's not moving or flowing yet. That's the pressure it's at. And then, boy, that just keeps jumping around on me. B5 is equal to 450 kPa. P6 was 100. And the upstream uh, stagnation temperature, so P T5, was 900 Kelvin. So I'm going to use T5 and P5 as the stagnation pressures and I need to use this diameter lift and discharge coefficient to get that cross-sectional area. Um, so I can, just as before, set up that equation for the cross-sectional area. Drag coefficient pi dl. Substitute that in for A. Put in um, 450 kilopascals there, 900 Kelvin there and there. Uh, R and, and gamma are um, still just the, the values we've been using for air. We're going to use a gamma equal to 1.35 and we'll use, continue to use R equal to um, 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram degree Kelvin. Substituting all that in, um, I can solve for the choke mass flow of 0 0.3611 kilograms per second. 
So at the moment that the exhaust valve opens, it's definitely going to be choked because of this pressure ratio. And the flow rate initially leaving is going to be uh, 0.361 kilograms per second. All right, that'll wrap up this lecture. We'll, we'll do some more examples in class covering some of